the Advocates for Human Rights to be here. It's a pleasure and an honor to speak before you. And as Maria mentioned, I'm the director of the Women's Human Rights Program. I've been at the Advocates for almost 13 years now, working on women's human rights issues and the death penalty. I am the substitute for Robin Phillips tonight, and she does send her regrets that she cannot be here. I am excited to talk, though, and, and actually take her place this evening because I do a lot of monitoring and documentation of human rights violations in other countries at the Advocates. And with regard to where I have done the monitoring, um, I've monitored domestic violence in Tajikistan, Bulgaria, Croatia, Mongolia, and Serbia. I've monitored transitional justice in Sierra Leone two years after the war ended, meaning we were looking at how the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission were functioning. And next week, I'm actually leaving to go to Montenegro to monitor domestic violence in that country for two weeks. So I'm excited to share some of my experiences with you tonight. I was not going to talk too much about the background of the Advocates for Human Rights so that I could focus my remarks on the presentation at hand. But I'm happy to take questions at the end, and I've also left some literature at the back by the water, um, the water cooler there. Um, in terms of a preview, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is <coughs> what is monitoring and documentation. I'll lay, some of the, I'll lay out some of the principles that we go by and that we adhere to when we go into these countries. And then I'm going to talk about the logistics of actually going in and conducting the monitoring. Um, and within all this, I'll try to share with you as many stories as I can. And I think uh, you will hear many of the mistakes I have made over the years on these monitoring missions, but I like to look at them as lessons learned. Whenever I go into these countries, I always learn something new to strengthen our monitoring process or what we need to, ma to make it better the next time around. So as I leave for Montenegro next week, I will not only be carrying my luggage, but also a question as to what I will learn new <laughs> on this next monitoring mission. So let's begin by looking at what is monitoring. Well, here you have a definition. We're basically collecting, verifying, and using information that we find out about human rights violations. And we're using a detailed methodology, a systematic approach in order to gather and verify and assess that information. So in other words, what human rights monitors are doing is they are seeking to identify and investigate the extent to which reality falls short of those objective human rights standards that we see in international law. So there are lots of different types of monitoring. You may have heard about process monitoring, like court watch observations or elections observations. There may be media monitoring going on, and you've probably been a part of, or maybe even led some of the focus groups yourself. These are all different forms of monitoring. For this talk, I'm going to focus on the kind of monitoring that the Advocates does, which is qualitative monitoring, where we use interviews and the observations at those interviews to gather information. So this picture here is from our Mongolia mission. We went to Mongolia, you see the team there. And we were there twice, once in January and once in March. So you can see we've got a team of volunteers, our interpreters, um, and our local partners sitting at this table. And by way of kind of a, a funny little story, before we went to Mongolia, we were thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to Mongolia in January. And so we piled on our down comforters and our smart wool long underwear and our heavy thick boots. And we get to Mongolia in January, one of the coldest places on earth. And it's actually colder in Minnesota. So <laughs> we're like, oh, <laughs> all right, I guess we'll take some comfort in, in being here with all of our heavy wolves. Next, please. So what are your goals of monitoring? Well, let's take a look at some of the goals when we monitor domestic violence laws. We are looking at how the government is complying with its international obligations in terms of both the laws on the books and how it's using those laws in practice. We're also looking at the responses of very specific sectors. We talked to the police, we talked to lawyers, social workers, doctors, and judges, and many, many others to see what is working and where they are failing. We also look at laws, both how they are written and how they work in practice, to see how they're working to protect victim safety and offender accountability. And that third bullet point is really important because when I'm sitting in an interview and I'm thinking about the next question that I have to ask or how to evaluate right on the spot what they just said, I ask myself, 
How does this affect victim safety? How is this promoting offender accountability? And that really helps me gauge their responses and what's going on in the country. And finally, another goal is we are able to influence upcoming legal reforms that may be pending. Maybe Parliament is on the verge of passing a new domestic violence law. If we can go in and document the human rights violations and show why that law is so needed, then it's another tool for our partners on the ground to use to get that law passed. Next. So here's four examples of what, of what monitoring can actually reveal. I'm going to share some real examples here. The first problem, I can actually learn about this just sitting at my desk right here in Minnesota. And those are problems that I see right in the language of the law. For example, if you look at Bulgaria's criminal code, if you're a victim of domestic violence by a family member, the state is not gonna prosecute your abuser. Because you are related to him, because he's a family member, you have to privately prosecute that case all by yourself. Which means you either get enough money to hire your own attorney, or you get to navigate the criminal justice system by yourself, which means collecting all the evidence, doing all the testimony gathering, um, doing the cross-examination, and so on. So that's something you can read right on the language of the laws. Um, but hopefully, I think Bulgaria is on the verge of amending that. So there is some hope around the corner for that. The second kind of problem that monitoring can reveal is problems that you see both in the language of the law and when it's actually used. And I'm going to use the example of psychological violence in Croatia. When I look at the definition of domestic violence in Croatia, it says it's physical violence, it's sexual violence, and it's also psychological violence. When I see psychological violence in a law, I've got red sirens going off in my head. That is a red flag, because what that tells me is it could be used against the victim. And that's what we have seen happening in practice in Croatia. What's happening is, is that a victim will call the police, and the police will come to the house and then she'll say, he beat me, but then her husband, the abuser, may say, well, she insulted me. And so the police are arresting the victims alongside with their perpetrators um, because they also committed domestic violence. And this is happening in 43% of domestic violence cases. And to share with you a story of what we learned during our monitoring in Croatia, there was a woman whose husband threatened to kill her seven times. The seventh time, he chased her around the house with a knife saying, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to butcher you so nobody recognizes you. Well, when the police came, she told them what happened, and he said, well, she called me senile. And the police said, oh, ma'am, you really, really insulted him. And so they gave him a fine of 1,000 kuna, which is a local Croatian currency, for beating her and trying to kill her with a knife, and they gave her a fine of 6,000 kuna for calling him senile. So you can see how a problem like this that is in the language of the law can also play out to very great harm for victims in practice. The third kind of example that monitoring reveal is where the law doesn't say anything. I don't see anything when I'm sitting at my desk in Minneapolis. But then when you go in and you're doing the monitoring, all of a sudden that's when you learn about these practices. And we've heard about this practice also in Croatia called facing. I had no idea it existed before I went to Croatia. But all of a sudden I was meeting with judges and I say, well, how do you tell who's telling the truth when it's a he says, she says kind of thing in domestic violence? And the judges said, well, we use a practice called facing. We have both parties, the victim and the other, uh, the abuser, face each other and stand maybe about <coughs> six feet apart. They have to look each other in the eye and tell their version of the events that happened. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine, for a victim of domestic violence, that's extremely traumatic, and it's not likely to result in candid testimony. Um, and this is not something I would have discovered had we not gone there and done these interviews and heard over and over from many judges who are using this practice. And the final kind of problem that monitoring reveal is where the law is completely neutral, but you learn that it's not being used in a very good way. So let me give the example. Um, again, I'll use this in Croatia, but I know it happens in many other countries. They have in their criminal code that you have the right not to have to testify against your spouse. We have that in our laws too. I'm sure you've all seen that um, in the laws and in other practices. But the problem is, is that when it is implemented in Croatia and the wife says, I cannot and I will not testify against my husband, the prosecution ends. They do not go forward without the victim's testimony, so they'll just simply close the case. So these are four examples of the kinds of different problems that monitoring 
So this is a quick snapshot of the process of monitoring and what it can lead to. You have your monitoring, your fact finding, you're going in to collect information during your mission. Then the next stage is your documentation. You've got 90 interviews maybe when you come back all saying different things. It's a lot of chatter, a lot of different issues. So you have to take this and boil it down and spot the issues, analyze your findings. And from that, when you spot the patterns, you can make your recommendations based on that. Then we publish a report and that's what we use to do our advocacy. Maybe we're trying to change the laws. Maybe we're gonna bring this report to the UN and tell the UN to tell that country to change their laws or their practices. And we can also use the report to inform us when we go back and do trainings. Because right now what we wanna do is we wanna go back and do seminars for police in Croatia. We wanna teach them how to identify the primary aggressor, how to know what defensive injuries look like on a man so that they know they're defensive injuries and not aggressive injuries. So they are not arresting both the victim and the perpetrator. And so all of these steps are what lead to change in the laws, the policies, and the practices. So let me give you an example of monitoring's impact. Uh, one, I'm gonna use the Croatia report. I can also use a, um, the Bulgarian report as well. In Croatia, what we learned is that there are seven autonomous shelters, meaning they're not state or government-run shelters. They're completely independent feminist organizations, and they're doing great work. I remember going around to these shelters and meeting with these young women who worked there, and they would tell me, last week we had a vote, and we voted no longer to take a salary. We're gonna work as volunteers, because we don't have any more funding right now. We've been waiting for months to get this promised funding from the government. And I went to another shelter and heard the exact same thing. And in a third shelter in a major city, that shelter had to close. So there were some serious funding shortages and the government was just not opening up its purse strings. In fact, we, they were basically withholding um, the contract negotiation, so it was not happening. Well, around that same time, Croatia was coming up for review before the UN, before a human rights body that some of you or all of you perhaps know called the Human Rights Committee. So this was our chance to bring our report to the Human Rights Committee along with our partner and tell them you need to urge the government of Croatia to fund these shelters and give them adequate funding. And so when the Human Rights Committee came out with their recommendations, you could see almost word for word from our report fund the, fund the shelters. What happened after that was that the Ministry of Social Policy and Youth opened up its purse strings and negotiated a three-year contract with the shelters. So you can see how having that international spotlight really can um, exert pressure and lead to change. In Bulgaria, we also used the report um, to change the laws in Bulgaria. What had happened was Bulgaria has a really good domestic violence law. It provides for an order for protection and it's actually modeled on Minnesota's law. Um, so you'll see a lot of similarities there. The only problem was, was that they did not criminalize the violation of an order for protection. So if a victim had a protection order, but her abuser came back to the house and say beat her again, the worst kind of penalty he would face was 24 hours in jail. And so people were very concerned because they said people are gonna realize that this law does not have teeth. So we published a report that was one of our priority recommendations was to change the law. And within a year, our partner was able to change that law in parliament, pass the law to criminalize violation. So this is a final snapshot of monitoring that leads to the report and recommendations and that can lead to all the different kinds of tools and outcomes to bring about change in that country. So next I want to talk about the human rights monitoring principles and these are kind of the rules of the road if you will. This is a list of the principles that we follow when we go into these and I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation that I've made mistakes and learned a lot of lessons. And I pretty much go into every monitoring mission assuming that something is going to surprise me and I'm going to learn something new. When something does surprise me, I used to actually panic and think, oh my gosh, the mission is gonna fail. <laughs> and now what I do is I just remember, all right, what are my monitoring principles? Come back to the monitoring principles and use these as your guidelines for what you're gonna do and how you're going to respond. So I'm only going to explain a few of these um, and what they mean when you're doing on the ground monitoring in another country. So the first and probably the most important principle of monitoring is to do no harm. This is 
pretty much self-explanatory. But it means doing no harm from every aspect of what you're doing. You must always keep this in the back of your head and ensure you're not doing any harm, whether it's direct harm or even incidental harm. So we're always thinking very carefully about our choices and our actions. So for example, this means not putting anyone in harm's way. Um, perhaps if you're going to be interviewing a survivor or a victim, you may want to take precautions. First of all, you want to make sure you're in a secure place where you're not going to get interrupted. But if you do get interrupted, maybe you want to come up with a precautionary plan that you switch to another safer topic, like the weather or famous landmarks in that country. Do no harm also applies to your own team as well. It's not just the people who are talking to the country, but we want to make sure that everyone who's involved in the monitoring is also not harmed during that. And I include this picture of a road in Mongolia because I was faced with probably one of the most difficult decisions uh, where it was, we were driving and it took us five hours to go 180 kilometers. What is that, 120 miles, I think? Yeah, it's not too far. It wouldn't take us too long here in Minnesota. But the problem was, was that we were about two hours in when we hit glare ice. And we all are Minnesotans. We've all driven on ice before. You know what it's like. You basically kind of control your skin. Well, once we hit that, we came out and I thought, oh, phew, that was, that was close. Well, then we hit another ice patch. And this one didn't stop. And it went on for the rest of the three hours. And we were in one of those little kind of Volkswagen buses that's very low to the ground. And I just, I worried so much for the safety of my team. And so when we got to our destination, um, I had some really difficult choices to make as to whether or not we continue going on to the next city where we had interviewees waiting for us or whether we go back and hope that the ice had melted um, and that we could get back safely. There were a number of different factors going on in both directions, but ultimately the entire decision came to what's gonna keep my team safest at this point. So we decided a chance that the ice had melted in the other direction and had by the time we went back and we set up interviews in another city. So we did change our plan in order to keep our team safe. The next principle is to know your standards, the best standards and the international law standards that are out there. This is integral to doing a good and effective monitoring mission. For example, the domestic violence standard regarding mediation. We all know that you never want to do mediation in domestic violence. And so once you know that standard, you're on high alert to hear that during your interview. So when I hear somebody say, oh yeah, well we have the victim and the abuser come together and we do mediation, all the sirens are going off in my head. And I know at that point, this is the point in the interview where I wanna stop, I wanna ask more questions, I wanna find out how often they're doing it, when they're doing it, and if victims get hurt, harmed during this mediation process. So knowing the standards really makes your monitoring more effective. The next one is to respect the mandate. Respect the mandate means stick to what you are there to do. You are there to gather information. You're not there to maybe some way set up a shelter or you know help out uh, people setting up an NGO. I mean, these, these kinds of things can come later maybe down the road, but you were there, you've got finite time, get your information. Now, there are a couple of exceptions, and there are cases oftentimes where interviewees will ask me for some resources or some tools or curriculum, and I will give that to them. And in this case, you see me with three Tajik police officers in Dushanbe. They did not have computers, and they were wondering if we had police resources for them. So I'm showing them our website, stopva.org, and downloading some police training tools for them there. There's another exception to when I might divert from this respect the mandate. And that is if someone's life is in danger. If I'm in a courthouse waiting for my interview and I see someone else threatening somebody else, I will go and get a security guard. Um, I, will, I would intervene in that case, of course. And I had one instance when I was in Mongolia when I did divert out of the mandate. And this was a situation where the woman was in such grave danger. This woman was a victim of domestic violence for 30 years at the hands of her husband. He beat her, he beat the children, and he used axes and scissors and whatever he could to inflict damage. He said he didn't want any of their five kids to go to school, so none of them ever went to school. Um, there were a lot of broken bones over the years. So she did try to go to the police, but the police were not helpful. And in fact, one of the police officers said to her, you're an old woman, why can't you go home and just figure this out with your husband? So she couldn't get any help from the police. 
Then she went to the doctors and they said, why don't you go and take this medical certificate and file for a criminal prosecution? Take this to the police and they'll take it to the prosecutors. Well, she brought all of her documentation to them and then they lost it all. She could not find that. So that route was closed to her. She next thought she could get a divorce from him, but he had destroyed the marriage certificate. So she was in the process of trying to locate something else through the registry so she could actually go through with that process. She told me that she really wanted to go to a shelter, but there's only one shelter in Mongolia, and that was about five hours away. And finally, she ended the interview. She said, my husband is in jail. He's been serving a 30-day jail sentence. He's coming on in five days, and when he comes out, he says he's going to find me, and he's going to kill me. And at that moment, it was one of those moments where my jaw just dropped, and I, it really hit me that this woman was in danger. And we were in a very small town, and she was certainly connected with a local volunteer who worked with the NGO in the capital city. But I, we wanted to do something at that moment to, to help her. And so we finished the interview, and then we said, okay, we're going to make you a safety plan. I've never made anyone a safety plan in my life. Um, in fact, I didn't even know what steps first to take. So we, again, we got on the internet, which was excruciatingly slow. I remember thinking, we've got to download this now. And we downloaded from our website um, a safety plan. Um, it was steps like uh, put some speed numbers into your cell phone of friends and family who you can call an emergency, keep your documents in a safe place at a friend's house, identify emergency exits in your home and practice getting out of them, things like that. So our interpreter sat down with her and they went through, because not all of them are applicable in a Mongolian context, but they went through and identified ones that would help for her. So in that case, that's um, just one example, I think, ever that I've really intentionally deviated from respecting the mandate. The next one is to exercise good judgment, because like I said, you will always have unexpected situations um, when you're monitoring. And I want to share a few stories um, where I have encountered these and what I've learned from them. The first example is we were in Tajikistan and we traveled outside the capital city to a very <coughs> rural village we were, where we were going to interview the women living in that village. It was a very tiny town. It's one of those towns where there's just a single dirt road and there's probably maybe a dozen, maybe 20 houses there. Um, and we sat down in the middle of, by this dirt road underneath a tree where there was a bench set up. And it, it kind of looked like the local kind of park or gathering area. So there we were, um, several Westerners, our two in, our interpreters, and about five or six of the local women standing around. <coughs> we were certainly a sight for the small village. So we began our questions um, in the open here outside saying, so um, what can you tell us about domestic violence? And you could see them looking at each other and they just said, nothing. I said, well, is domestic violence a problem here? And again, you could see them looking at each other and they said, no. And at this point we realized this is not good. We are out in the open talking about domestic violence where everybody can see us. We were drawing a great deal of attention we need to bring this inside. We should have done this inside. We should have started it in a place where it felt safe and where we could have made sure and ensured that their confidentiality was protected. Um, so that was a good lesson learned. Um, so now if we're going to do something like that, we make sure that we're in a place where people feel safe, secure, and there's good privacy. You also have to exercise good judgment for the rogue co-interviewer or interpreter. Um, I haven't really had any problems with this so much, but sometimes you do hear about people who have interpreters who will kind of go off on their own and start having their own conversations and you don't know what they're talking about. But in that, that case, you just need to take control back of the situation and if worse comes to worse, simply end the interview. The other thing is, is showing empathy in an interview because we do sometimes interview victims. And that's something we are always faced with. How do you show empathy when someone has told an excruciating story of the abuse that they have survived? And one of my colleagues said what I thought was one of the best answers ever. We had finished interviewing a woman and she told her story of domestic abuse. And when she finished, she said, you know, it's just my story and I'm just one person. And my colleague said, well, one domestic violence victim is one too many. And I thought that was one of the most powerful things she could say. Other good things you can just say is, I'm sorry, you know, nobody should ever have to go through this and showing empathy. Um, and I think whether to hug or not, I've heard people on both sides of that equation. <laughs> some people are huggers, some people are not. I'm kind of an awkward, <laughs> you know, okay, let's, let's hug. Um, so it's, it's, I think you just gotta read the situation. 
I've, I've taught it both ways, and now at this point, after doing so many monitoring missions, I just say, read the situation, and if you think someone needs a hug and would welcome it, then I think it's okay. So, next. The next principle is to respect the authorities. We want to get permission to interview where appropriate. And I'm going to give you an example here. Um, what we do before we go into any monitoring mission is I send letters to the ministries, the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry for Social Policy, and I write them a letter and say, can we have permission to interview your employees? Because if you don't, you may be denied that interview. I remember going to Tajikistan, and we walked in, and the prosecutors in Tajikistan are the most powerful people in that country. And so we were a little nervous, thinking how much time are he gonna give us? And we said, how much time do you have for us? And he gestured to this letter sitting on his desk from his chief prosecutor, and he said, he just sent me a letter saying that you sent him a letter, and my time is your time. I have all the time in the world for you. So that really opened the door for us. Conversely, we did not do this when we went to Mongolia for the first time. So when we tried to interview a prosecutor there, he said, did you get permission from the minister? And we said, no. And fortunately, our interpreter was his niece. So he said, okay, I'll give you the interviewer because this is my niece and I'm her uncle, but you need to go get permission. So that was another lesson learned, and we always do that. And the next one is maintain confidentiality. This means keeping people's names a secret as well. But you also gotta think more broadly because people um, are sometimes living in small towns and they may be able to find out where you've been and who you've talked to. And so one mistake I learned the hard way was I, I sat down in an interview and you kind of make a little bit of small talk and chit chat. And I said, oh, your country is so beautiful. I really enjoyed being here. And the interviewee said, oh, that's wonderful. What cities have you been to? And I started rattling off all the cities before I thought, oh my gosh, I just revealed all the cities that we've been to. So maintaining confidentiality means being aware of everything you're saying and what you're revealing. We also want to make sure that we're thinking about how we're going to use those interviews because when I go in, I'm telling them, we're going to use your interviews to write a report. But now when we go in, we know that we're doing a lot of advocacy before the UN. We're oftentimes using our interviews to bring the information to the UN in the form of shadow reports. So now I also add, we will also be using your information you provide us uh, to submit reports to the United Nations. So that way, um, I'm protecting their privacy. They know what's going on. They have informed consent. There is one exception to maintaining confidentiality, and that's when we're interviewing high-level officials, because there's a lot of weight that care is carried when you say we interview the prime minister, or we interviewed a minister of so-and-so, because they are talking in their position of authority as a government representative. So in that case, we don't typically maintain confidentiality. And here's a picture from Bulgaria where we are interviewing um, a ministry official. How am I doing on time? I just want to make sure I'm respecting okay. your time here. Okay, great. So now I want to get into our methodology. How do we actually go about and monitor domestic violence? Let's go ahead. Well, we take a number of steps. First of all, we have to find out what is the information we need to get and how are we going to obtain it. And the way that we do this is we study those laws like crazy and then we craft interview questions. We are in the thick of crafting our interview questions for Montenegro and we spend a lot of time on these. I would say it takes me about half a day to do a set of interview questions for the police. Take me another half a day to do them for prosecutors, another half a day to do them for judges, and so on. So we put a lot of focus on them. Then we need to outline the international legal obligations. The right to life. What other, what other rights are there? It's the right to be free from torture, um, the right to liberty and security of person, the right to freedom from discrimination. But these are very high overarching rights. So when you're going in and looking at domestic violence, what does that really mean in practice? What does equal protection of the law really mean? you got to break it down. Well, maybe that means she can access the courts. Maybe equal protection means free legal aid. Maybe it means uh, the judges are actually responding within 24 hours and not waiting three days to issue an order for protection in emergency cases. We also recruit and we train monitors to come with us. We are actually having two volunteer lawyers who are coming with us to Montenegro, and they are coming along to do the monitoring side by side with us. And what's so great about that is they help us expand how much information we can get. We've essentially doubled our team size and we can get twice as many interviews. We do a lot of background research. We are researching every news article, collecting all the reports we can find. And even if we've got time, we'll read cultural books to learn more about the culture and the landscape there. And we also research the relevant laws and legal system. 
And then we go in and we do the interviews. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we do that. And when we come back, we organize and we finalize the interview notes. And this is really important because these are the raw findings. And this is the data that you have to build your report. So the more that we can keep up with our interview notes from day to day, the better it is when we come home. Then we analyze the findings from these interviews. And usually we have a stack of interviews this thick whenever we come home from mon a monitoring mission. So we are reading and rereading these interviews to get an idea of the patterns and the outliers and coming up with explanations for why this might be happening or why this is not happening. Um, fortunately now, we're using a software program that helps us analyze this a lot more quickly. So the wonders of technology are making us more efficient in this stage, which is good. We also review any records and written materials we may get. Sometimes when I'm in an interview, I'll ask a police officer, can I have a copy of a police report on domestic violence you've done? You can blacken out the names. I would just love to see you know, how detailed it is, how thorough it is, um, what kind of information are they gathering? Then we draft a report and recommendations, and like I mentioned earlier, we use that for advocacy and education. So who do we interview? Well, this is kind of a snapshot of the people who we try to interview when we go to these different uh, countries and do these missions. And I want to talk a little bit using a few of these to talk about what these interviewees can provide us in terms of information. Well, first of all, you can get some very compelling quotes from these people. We were interviewing the Croatian State Secretary, and I was talking to him about those shelter funding shortages I mentioned earlier this evening. And I asked him a question, I said, well, how do you expect these shelters to function during this shortage of funding when they have no money? And he literally shrugged his shoulders and said, normally. And I wrote that down. And I wrote down the fact that he shrugged his shoulders and smirked, and that went into the report. So it was a very powerful quote that we were able to use. Lawyers, they are very good because they can help explain and walk you through the system and tell you this is how it actually proceeds through the system. These are the kind of pitfalls we see. These are the challenges. You know, you should be asking these kinds of questions. So lawyers are very good. Um, I mentioned earlier, you can also find out about practices that are not written down, but that everyone's using anyway, just like that facing example I use that judges um, have been using in Croatia. And then finally, you can find out about laws that may seem normal in practice, but still harm the victims. And I mentioned some of those examples earlier as well. Now I do want to add one note about victims. They were last on that list that I provided earlier about people who we interviewed. We don't typically interview victims unless they have full informed consent that they can give us. They know what it's going to be used for and they're just fine with doing the interview with us. And second of all, if they have support structures afterward, because they are retelling a very difficult story of the abuse that they endured. So we want to make sure that they have some sort of support system with the NGO or the shelter with whom they're staying. When I do interview victims, I don't use a set of structured interview questions. I'm not trying to extricate information from them like I am from a police officer or anybody, but I just mostly let them tell their stories in a way that they feel comfortable. Um, and you can certainly expect that there may be a little bit of distrust or fear or some memory and concentration problems as they're revisiting this difficult time. When I interviewed a victim in one of the countries, she took a long time to tell her story and she would circle back to the past repeatedly, um, and she would revisit the events because she'd remember something else that she wanted to add. And that's fine, and you just continue to let her tell that. Um, so that's just a little bit about interviewing victims. Uh, moving on, I want to talk about how we do uh, the interviews themselves. So we can go ahead to the next slide. As I mentioned, we will not always have ideal conditions when we go in and do the Monitoring. So we just need to use our judgment to decide how we're going to deviate from those guidelines. And we take advantage of opportunities to gather information on the ground. I had a co-worker when she was in Peru and they were looking at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission there. And what she would do is they were taking taxis to get all around. They would talk to the taxi drivers, just do some informal information gathering. Say, what do you think about the TRC? You know, what do you think is working? And they could get some information that way too. In terms of interview conditions, we almost always have two people per interview. One person is the lead interview who is sitting there asking the questions, and they do the introduction. Another person is sitting there as a note taker, and they are typing away on their laptops, and of course they will have a chance after the interview is done to ask questions 
and get some clarification. We do typically use interpreters. Um, in some rare cases, people may speak English, but usually we use interpreters, so take your interview time and slash it in half, because that's how much time you've got to get your information. Laptops are actually, we do use laptops. Um, when I first started monitoring with the advocates, we went to Tajikistan and we were not using laptops. We were using old fashioned pen and pencils and papers because we feared that the laptops would have a chilling effect on our interviewees and we did not want to do that. So we stuck with pencil and paper. Um, and that got to be a little bit challenging after you've been writing for eight hours in a day. But I still bring a notepad around with me when I do these interviews because a laptop with a laptop you are at the mercy of your battery. And you never know if you're gonna find a plug to plug in your laptop, and I have run out of battery juice before. So I always got a notepad ready um, in my hand in case that happens. One to two interviewees at a time is ideal, and I'm gonna share some stories where I walk into interview situations, and this is not the situation, but ideally we wanna have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. So in the ideal interview setup, we have as few people as possible in the room. Um, and you wanna make sure that the setup of the room is conducive to a good monitoring situation. And really key to that is the seating of the interpreter. Because the interpreter has to be heard by three people, if you think about it. The person who you're interviewing, you if you're asking the questions, and the note taker. And so they've gotta be positioned in a place where they can still talk and everyone can hear them. Um, but you're still in the main point of focus um, face to face with your interviewee. Mm -hmm. As for your conduct during the interview, you also wanna make sure you're maintaining eye contact with the interviewee. At times I have gone into interviews by myself because we have split up. And that's when if you can type and look at somebody at the same time and nod, <laughs> it's a very good skill to have because you wanna be connecting with your interviewee. You also wanna be aware of cultural considerations and that's why it's good to do your research beforehand. Before we went to Mongolia, we had somebody in town who had taught in Mongolia for six months and he came and talked to us about the culture there. And he said it is actually considered rude to sit in a chair and put your uh, foot up on your knee, like how we normally sit, because it's offensive to show somebody the bottom of your foot, the bottom of your shoe. And so I would never have known that, but we were very cognizant about that and tried our best not to do that. You also want to avoid judgmental or evaluative remarks or expressions, and this is where your poker face is so important because you will hear some really alarming things. But you can't do this, you know, because that is just gonna chill your interview. I've also learned not to pass judgment on somebody when they first walk in. And that is something that I found myself doing, and I remember sitting in Mongolia, and this police officer walked in, and for some reason I just thought, this guy's gonna cop an attitude. He's gonna tell me that women start domestic violence, it's just their problem, and it's a private matter. And you know what? He turned out to be one of the best police officers I've ever interviewed. He was so protective of women, he said, I want to fight domestic violence because I have two young daughters. He was fantastic. So that experience really taught me, hold back your judgment, be objective, because you don't know what you're gonna get. You also wanna be patient. And this is really hard sometimes because typically our interviews are 90 minutes. I've even done them in 30 minutes. And like I said, if you're using an interpreter, cut that down, you've got a 15 minute interview. But at the same time, you need to also do it um, with a good flow where you're starting to establish a rapport. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but you need to prioritize your questions. You need to get to the most important ones when you don't have much time. We don't typically interrupt the speaker. I let them speak. And I'm not really pushing the interviewee that much. Um, I'm not treating this like a cross-examination, but I am trying to extricate as many details as I can. And finally, you have to kind of exercise your good judgment as to when it's time to stop if you finish early. As for beginning the interview, we start and we say, okay, what's your name? What is your official title? Uh, what's the organization or the unit that you work for? We know the city, the contact information date, all the team members' names, everything we can. And I have them write down their names at, on my notebook, and I try to keep as good of track as I can of these, because by the end, you're gonna have all these little slips of paper. <laughs> you're gonna be like, oh wait, was this on Monday's interview at two o'clock? So you wanna make sure that you are keeping good track of people's names, and you're keeping them in a safe location. Um, we do make an introductory statement. We have a short script we use, and we say, Hi, my name is Rose Park, I'm with the Advocates. We are here to monitor domestic 
violence. Uh, we will be using your interview to publish a report with recommendations and do some advocacy before the UN. Do you have any questions before we begin? Um, we do tell our interviewees that we will keep their names confidential, unless, of course, they're a high-level government representative. And it's really important to establish basic rapport in the beginning of uh, an interview because you never know that that person might actually be nervous or they may be recalcitrant. Maybe they don't even wanna be sitting in that room with you. I've had all three of those situations happen. In fact, one time I remember a police officer walked in, he was really agitated. I remember thinking, what is, what's wrong with this guy? It turned out that he was just nervous. He was really nervous to be sitting down and talking with us. And after about 30 minutes, he finally relaxed. So what I typically do is just make a little bit of um, small talk, demonstrate some knowledge about the city, or talk about the food, or the landmarks you've seen. We ask open-ended questions. You will have some yes or no questions, but it's best to let them talk, so we keep our questions very open. And like I said, we want to set them at ease. So I start with the very non-controversial questions, the less sensitive questions. Tell me about your role. How long have you been working here? And how many people, how many employees do you oversee? Those are really easy questions that are a good way to get people feeling comfortable with you and the situation. We also want to make sure we're getting clarification of anything we don't understand because there are no second chances. Chances are this is the last time you're ever going to see this person and have a chance to interview them. We avoid leading questions. And we ask questions in very concise language. And it's very important here not to use slang or colloquialisms. Um, and I am guilty of that on so many counts. My, my actually it was Robin who called me out on this one day because I said um, the phrase, I want you to understand where I'm coming from. And she said, you know, I've seen, uh, it was in Czech Republic, he was walking with a couple Americans, this Czech guy, and I said, hey, we're so glad you understand where we're coming from. And the man literally looked behind him to see where they were coming from. <laughs> so it's the small things that you don't think about but that are important, especially when you're working through an interpreter, to think about the kind of lingo you are using. And I already talked about victims and how we let them tell their story chronologically and in a way that's comfortable to them. And as for the interview questions, I am always prepared. I've got my interview set, but I'm always prepared to deviate from them because I may hear something outrageous, um, like we use mediation all the time, and I, you have to be prepared to go down that rabbit hole and get more details and get more stories. Um, we wanna be as thorough as possible. Treat every interview as though it's your last with that person. Be careful not to ask questions outside the project mandate. It may be very tempting to ask questions about sex trafficking or sexual harassment in the workplace, but if your mandate is to do domestic violence, that's what you need to focus on. You should ask your interviewee to spell out names or cities as needed. And again, put on your poker face. Don't show disbelief or anger about things you, you hear. And stories. Stories are so important because that is what builds your report. The details about the injuries, the history of domestic violence, weapons were used. That really is what breathes life into your findings and into your report. Um, so, and sometimes it can be really hard to get the details uh, because people, I might ask a question, say, well, what happened? They say, oh, he beat her. Well, what, ha what kind of injuries has she sustained? She had some bruises. Well, did he use any weapons? Oh yeah, he used a knife. Well, did he ever use that knife on her? Oh yeah, one time he cut her throat. And so by asking very, very poignant, directed questions, you can, it's sometimes up to you to elicit those responses um, and get those details. And of course, um, we will end up coming across difficult interviewees. This does happen, and you just have to know how best to handle it. I have certainly sat across the table from interviewees who have no information, and because they're not working on domestic violence, and sometimes that just happens. That happened to my colleague in Mongolia. She thought she was going to be interviewing a doctor or a nurse from the hospital. Instead, they sent her the accountant. And so she had to just back up and change her questions quickly and ask questions about budgeting um, and how they budget for domestic violence and things like that. When I'm faced with that situation, I typically back way up and I say, okay, well tell me, um, what do you think are the root causes of domestic violence? Uh, what do you think it will take to end domestic violence? What are the biggest problems in your country? And you're getting more overarching attitudes. So it still can be a very valuable interview. You just need to back up and get more of the attitude. Um, you will also maybe encounter difficult or hostile interviewees. This is a hard situation, and in this case, you just have to maintain your professionalism. You have to avoid a judgmental response. 
And what I do is sometimes ask questions in different ways to ensure that they understand where you're coming from. Oh, I just said it. <laughs> that they understand what you're asking and that you're going to be persistent. So I have a couple stories on this point. Um, one time we were in Mongolia and my colleague was doing the questioning and she said, well, how many arrests have you made in domestic violence in the past year? And the police officer said, women cause domestic violence. They are always starting the fights. You know, they just don't know how to take care of their home, blah, blah, blah. She said, okay but how many arrests have you made for domestic violence in the past year? And then he went off again about the root cause of domestic violence and how women are the problem and so on. And she said, okay, but how many arrests have you made in the past year for domestic violence? And he said, zero. So sometimes it just takes a very persistent questioning to get to the answer. In another case, I've also had a very hostile interviewee in Tajikistan where I was sent to go interview a forensic doctor. And this was a very hard interview to get. They were very difficult to access and we had one interview with a forensic doctor on entire mission. And it was up to me to get the information. And I remember walking in there and I was quite nervous. This was very early in the beginning of my work with the advocates. And we walked in and the doctor was sitting at a table watching black and white cartoons. And he didn't get up to greet us, he just sat there and watched cartoons. And I remember being so nervous and thinking, I just gotta get the information, I'm just gonna try and ask questions around these cartoons that are going on. And literally, he was just giving me one word answers like that. And so finally our partner said, can we just turn off the TV? And she went over and did that. And that's what I should have done. So when you have a situation where you've got a difficult or a hostile interviewee, this is your interview. Remember it's your interview and you can take back that control. Um, the other kinds of difficult situations is when you get the focus group interviewee. I have walked into a interview room expecting to interview one or two police officers and I've encountered 20. In that situation, you don't have time to interview everybody and there's also going to be sort of a chilling effect on the room because you know someone's boss is also sitting in that room. That's when you back up and you treat it like a focus group. The other kind of um, difficult situation is when you get three interviewees of different professions. And this happens to me all the time, and I don't know why, but I have walked into a room so many times where I have a social worker, I have a lawyer, and a psychologist. It almost sounds like I'm setting up to tell a joke about how three of them walk into a bar, right? It's like three very different professions. And the reason why it's so hard is because they're all doing very important, very significant, but very detailed work, or different work on domestic violence and I can't drill down very far with any of them in 90 minutes. So I just, I'm usually typically able to go down about 50% and get as much detail as I can. Um, but that is, that for me is probably one of the most difficult interviews to do. Again, I talked about uh, different kinds of interruptions. You just have to be prepared for those, that will happen. Um, and just, you know, carry on and make sure you've got a plan ahead of time. And then finally, we, we do encounter people who do ask us for resources or for support. In that case, um, what I typically do is I say, you know, I'm not able to provide you with any support, but I can give you some resources um, or some names of some foundations that perhaps you can apply to. So that happened to us in Sierra Leone where they emailed and he asked me for some financial support. And I said, you know, there, there's this actually company or this organization that provides uh, technical equipment. And I did hear back from him for several months, and then he sent me an email and said, I applied to that organization you sent me, and we're all getting new computers for our office, which is fantastic. So even though you may not be able to help them directly, you can certainly direct them to resources that may be able to. And then finally, some more notes. Um, I'm trying to be cognizant of the time here to allow for questions. You want to basically anticipate potential problems. Make sure you can create trust in them. I mean, you're certainly not gonna become friends with them. That is one thing you have to be aware of. You're not there to become friends. Um, you're there to get information. This is an objective interview. Demonstrate your understanding of challenges. If people, if I'm talking to two police officers and they're telling me that they're the only two police officers to serve 1,200 people, you can nod in empathy. That's just fine. Um, sometimes I will rephrase my questions if I'm not getting the answer I sought, kind of like how I described before. And if all else fails, and you're really having a difficult time, you could end the interview and you can try to reschedule. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, better than just floundering along and doing more harm in the end. Mm -hmm. Finally, you can also seek additional information while you're there. I might ask somebody, hey, do you know anybody else who we should interview while we're here? 
I will also get as many relevant documents as I can while I'm there. They're in a different language, but that's okay. I can get those translated with volunteers and Google Translate. And you're also using your observations. And that is so important because you can pick up a lot of good information. In one case, we were in Croatia. And I said, where are your courtrooms? And they said, these are our courtrooms. And we were sitting in the judge's office. They were probably about 12 feet by 12 feet, crowded with shelves and desks and books and chairs. And so I looked, and the chair next to me was probably about two feet away. And so when you're talking about domestic violence, that's how far the victim has to sit from her abuser. So I was frantically drawing in that notepad of mine a diagram of the room and just eyeballing the number of feet and meters that the distance of the room was. You can also include observations about demeanor. One time I asked a police officer, I said, when you go to the scene of domestic violence, how do you know what kinds of questions to ask? And he said, it's all in here. And he did that. And so I wrote that down and we included it in our report because it demonstrated that they did not have an official pocket card or a police protocol of questions they should be asking. After you end the interview, we always give each other a chance to ask follow-up questions. We say we give the interviewee one last chance to add anything else, um, ask us more questions, and make sure they know about confidentiality and how the information will be used. Mm -hmm.